Good morning, everyone. It is Thursday morning, and as promised, we are going to the farm. But we're not just going to a New York farm, we're also going to a Iowa farm, a two-in-one day. So this is going to be exciting and fun, and we've brought you a lot of virtual farm tours over the last couple of months, and here's a purely educational tour that we want to bring you on. Hi, I'm Gina O'Toole. I'm the Executive Director of the New York Beef Council, and welcome. And we are going to meet Betsy Hicks in a little bit. Betsy is the owner operator of Maple Acres here in New York State. And then we're gonna go out to Iowa. We're gonna go west and we are going to meet Graham Hicks of Graham Feedlot. So we're gonna see a cow calf where they raise the animals. And then we're gonna go to Graham where we see how they, um, or how they are finished up or Nate, Nate Graham, oh my gosh. So this is, this is how this day is gonna go and the caffeine's starting to kick in. So I hope you join the pencils and papers, ask questions as we go along. And uh, I'd like to start out and do a brief introduction. So Dan, who's helping facilitate this with us at the New York Beef Council and Iowa, we're gonna start throwing some slides here as to who we are and what we do. So we are the New York Beef Council we are represented and we are funded by our beef producers in New York State. Now the population in New York is a strong 19.45 million, but our cattle numbers are about almost just shy of 1.5 million. And out of that, the majority of them are dairy cows and uh, you can see the numbers there for our beef cows. So it's like six dairy cows to one beef cow. And overall, we kind of kind of joke a little bit that we have 15 people per cow here in New York State. But the really blow your mind thing is that we have 7,300 farmers here in New York State. So a lot of people think that it's just New York City. No, there's a lot of agriculture in New York. And now here's a quick snapshot of Iowa. Iowa's population is 3.15 million. So to put it in perspective, there's 9.3 million people in New York City. So Iowa's entire state population is only a third of New York City alone. But look at their cattle numbers, 3.9 million. So there's many cattle in Iowa as there are people in New York City. Mind blowing. So looking at the number of beef farms, like I said, we had 7,300, they have 25,000. And then of course those dairy farms are close to 2,000. So the number of jobs directly related to the cattle business in Iowa is 19,000. It's mind blowing. And so, we figured that Iowa is a beef state. They bring in those beef dollars, but we're the consumer state. So we created a partnership and a friendship and a collaboration of they send us their beef dollars and we promote beef to our consumers that eat beef. So here's a perfect opportunity to start asking questions if you have them. And uh, again, I want to quickly introduce Betsy. Uh, Hicks, she is owner operator of Maple Acres. I think we have a quick picture of Betsy. And uh, there she is. Hey, Betsy, how are you? Hey, Jean, we have a beautiful cow day here in central New York. <laughs> we definitely do. And we're really excited. And, and Betsy, I'd like you to take the time to kind of introduce yourself and give a brief history of your farm. Talk about a little bit about what you do and about your herd because oh my gosh they look beautiful back there in the nice long grass finally here in New York we've got grass finally yeah it seems like what a month ago we had snow yeah yes <laughs> So yeah, welcome to Maple Acres. I am Betsy Hicks. I am one of the owners of Maple Acres. Um, I run this cow-calf operation here in Cortland County with my husband, uh, Jesse, and we are predominantly a cow-calf operation. So what that means is we have calves born on our farm. We have two different times during the year. We calve in the winter in February and March with a select group of cows, but the majority of our cows are born out on grass in May um, this time of year, and we're almost on calving. I have one cow left to calve. <laughs> so uh, we started this farm in 18, I'm sorry, in 2009, but the farm has been in my husband's family since 1809. So wow. it is pretty special to be on this farm that's been in his family for over 200 years. Kind of neat that we started it at the 200 year birthday of the farm. So I'm um, gonna, yeah, go, go ahead, Jean. <laughs> okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna backtrack a little bit and I wanna talk about the beef life cycle because what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with you because you are where 
the beef life cycle starts. And you have been doing this for like a number of years. So Dan, if you can bring up those slides of the beef life cycle, we're gonna quickly walk through uh, a couple of those slides of that. So as we mentioned, here is the life cycle and Betsy is that cow calf. That's where everything starts, where they have the mama cows and they breed, uh, breed those cows to have those calves and then they have both bulls and they have heifers, which are the female cows. And as we're gonna go through and she's gonna explain kind of that life cycle on her, we're gonna talk about the weaning um, part of it. And uh, we'll go on, if you wanna go to the next slide, Dan. And uh, we're gonna talk about like that stocker and background grounders and what that means for the farming community here in New York. And then we're gonna jump over to Nate in a little while and we're gonna talk about those speed yards. So if we wanna go back to Betsy again real quick, and kind of explain, Betsy, what that cow-calf cycle looks like. Like you said, you've got um, how many cows, how many calves with one more calf to go, but, and there's a nice one right there. So kind of explain the whole um, aspect of it for our listeners. Yeah, so the number of cows on our farm varies according to what time of year it is. Um, and so right now, total head on the farm, I did the count this morning, we have 85 total head on the farm. Um, wow. 36 of them are mama cows. And so uh, we actually have 30 five calves on the farm right now because we have one left to go and so uh like i said we start calving in february and march with a few we're just going to back up here so we can see closer to the cows if i can avoid falling on my face it'd be actually on my back but that's okay <laughs> um so we calve cows the cows or the calves stay with their mamas uh, for about six months and so the mamas um, care for them they give them milk the calves nurse um, and basically what we do for them is to provide lush pasture for them to eat all year long um, well i wish it was all year long all season long so we graze from uh, about middle of may until november um, and so they provide us with beautiful calves and we provide beautiful pasture and a beautiful environment for them. What else do you want to know, Jean? <laughs> well, so one of the other things, and, and Dan just kind of flashed real, real quickly, is um, that uh, you put ear tags into the calves ear. So yeah. when the calf is born, what is the process once that calf is born? What do you do to take care of that uh, baby calf? And before you start is, um, well, go to do that, and then we'll talk about the, the mother's milking. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, so when calves are born, so the important thing to know about baby calves is they are not born with any immunity whatsoever. So it is super important that that calf gets colostrum. Colostrum is the first milk from the mother um, and is rich in antibodies, rich in, in immunity that that calf needs in order to survive. Um, so the first thing I do, no matter what it is time of year, make sure that calf comes out and is healthy and it is nursing. Um, so it can get that colostrum. We do have colostrum replacer, which is what's in this bag right here. And so if for some reason the mother doesn't have enough colostrum or it wasn't able to nurse for whatever reason, sometimes weird stuff happens, um, we make sure that we give them a uh, colostrum replacer. All uh, indicators are we, we try to get colostrum from the mothers, but we have these on hand just in case we need to help a calf out. Um, so that's first number one thing that we do. Um, once calf is nursing really well, um, we do uh, animal identification. So on our farm, we use two different types of tags. The first one is a farm tag, and this, these are just some blanks that we use. So what we do on our farm is we use the number, and then uh, the number of the year that they were born. So this is 2020, so all of our calves start with 20 this year. And then we do the birth order that they were born in. So the last calf tagged had 20-34. And so we use these blank tags so I can put uh, whatever farm identification we want. So these are the tags that we use and a tagger and I think Dan's got a picture of what a tagger might look up like close um, and we do those when the babies are very very young a day old um, and it doesn't hurt it's like a human going to get their ears pierced so it doesn't hurt brief little uh, pressure and off they go back with mama so uh, we also do individual weights on calves when they are born because it's important to keep track of records um, so we know birth weights from cows and the certain bull that we might have used the other sort of tag that we do are these um, RFID tags. And so RFID is radio frequency ID tags. And this tag stays with the animal 
uh, no, no matter if it leaves my farm or it stays on my farm, this stays with the animal for its entire life. Um, so this, whenever, so if I was to sell a cow or a steer, that uh, RFID tag could trace it back to that cow being born on my farm right here, because that number is unique to my farm and unique to that animal. So ID tags, weights, and most importantly, colostrum. Those are the first things that we do uh, to those calves when they're, when they're born. So speaking of weight, so the average human is about seven pounds when it's born. What is the average, what is your average uh, calf weight when it is born? Yeah, so for first time mothers, we like to aim for a little bit lighter calf, uh, maybe 70 pounds, maybe 65 70. pounds. <laughs> Yeah, about 10 times as much as a human baby, right? Um, some of our older mamas that have had multiple calves, we actually have a 15-year-old cow on the farm that actually gave birth on the 9th, and it is her 12th calf. So we are super excited uh, to have our new calf. Her calves usually weigh about 80 to 85 pounds, um, but she's having a calf as old hat to our, to our old Jess cow, and so she's doing great. She can have that 80, 85-pound calf, no problem. So another quick question too, and a lot of people get confused with this because of the dairy industry and, and the beef industry is that dairy cows, most of them are Holsteins and you have, a, you know, your breeds for dairy, but they, their milk production is for human consumption. But in the beef industry, that cow's pure milk production is for the calf. Absolutely. Yep. So with, when we select cows to keep for breeding, we want to make sure that they have great characteristics so that calf is able to nurse from that cow appropriately. Um, if the cow doesn't have great genetics and it has a poor udder conformation, it's probably not a calf that we're going to select for replacement because we need that calf to be able to nurse. We need to be able for that cow to provide uh, nourishment to that calf because like you said, Jean, that all that milk is going to that calf. I'm not milking a beef cow. <laughs> I have in the past. <laughs> I have when I we've had to uh, get colostrum to feed a calf that wouldn't nurse. Um, but yeah, that, that milk and that beef cow is for that calf. Is that Dottie coming to you? This is Dottie coming over to say hello. So well, Dottie, <laughs> Dottie is pretty special. She comes right on cue. It's wonderful. So yeah. Dottie is actually a twin. And the special thing about cows when they're born twins is that when a female is born twin to a male, she's going to go see Catherine now, my, my videographer. Um, so when a female is born twin to a male, 92% of the time, the female calf is sterile. Um, it, it's just the way it is. Two female calves born twins are fine. They can reproduce. Two male calves born together are fine. They can reproduce. The male that is twin with a female can fine. It can reproduce. But the way that that calf, uh, <laughs> everybody's coming over to say hello now. The way that calf um, is in, the, in utero and when it's in its mother, um, it affects the way that her reproductive system uh, develops. Um, and so you can do a blood test and we love Dottie. And so we did a blood test on Dottie and unfortunately she cannot reproduce. <laughs> so by all rights, Dottie should be somebody's steak by now. Mm -hmm. But Dottie, um, we use Dottie for education. So Dottie during, when we have school in session, Dottie goes to Cortland schools and teaches all the kids about uh, beef production. So she is uh, a willing participant, and which is great because we love Dottie. We don't want her to be stubborn. <laughs> well, that's fantastic. So, and one more piece that we want to cover before I start talking about like the next cycle, uh, next phase in the backgrounding phase is that talk about weaning, that how long the, the calves will stay on their mothers, and then that whole weaning aspect. Oh, he's going after the colostrum. <laughs> Juniper, I don't know. You know, when you do things live, you kind of get what you get. So thankfully, my cows are entertaining. <laughs> So um, we keep cows on their, or calves on their, their mamas for about six months. Um, we will wean in October. And so we try to make the weaning process as stress-free as possible. So we give them vaccinations. That's what this little foam, co foam cooler is for um, that everybody's looking on. Um, we have to keep vaccinations cold. And it's important that we give them vaccinations so that they are prepared for the little bit of stress that they will um, experience when they're weaned. So we give them a vaccine about a month prior, and then we give them a booster shot about two weeks prior to having any weaning stress. <laughs> 
but they're after my boots now. Um, and so when we do wean, we make sure that we wean with a gate in between so moms and babies can touch noses to each other because when they can touch and they can you know, reassure, reassure each other, it's far less stressful. The biggest thing, like I said, is just keeping things as stress-free as possible. When we don't have stress, their immunity can stay strong and nobody has any uh, uh, disease um, or any uh, sickness. So stress-free is the key for sure. <laughs> for sure. And we'll probably hear a little bit more from that uh, Nathan as well when we go to him. But so thanks so far, Betsy. Uh, I'm going to yeah. talk a little bit about what next says that when that animal is done being weeded, it will go into like the next phase. If it's not done on Betsy's farm, sometimes those cattle go on to a different farm. And those are your stock, um, your backgrounding phase where the cat, the, that calf will go from Betsy's to a stocker or backgrounder. And that's where he spends the majority, six to 12 months of age on the farm eating grass. And it's 100% grass for the most part while they're there. Sometimes they'll supplement with grain. But we have a lot of producers here in New York State because we do upstate New York have a lot of grass. And there's a lot of area that is not um, suitable for farming crops, but it is suitable for, for growing a lot of grass or creating hay as it were. So after that whole backgrounding phase, then a lot of cows go to our next person that we're going to. So we are going to hoof it, pun intended, all the way to Iowa, and we are going to meet Nate Graham of Graham Feedlot. Hey, Nate, how you doing? Takes a little while for the voice to connect. <laughs> can you hear me, Nate? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you now. So, Nate. Okay, perfect. This is Nate Graham in Iowa. And uh, you are owner operator of Grand Feedlot. Nate, I would love for you to introduce yourself and kind of give a history of your farm, and then we'll we'll dive in and talk about what you do and how you do it there. Sure. Well, um, I would be a fourth generation uh, on this farm um, up here in Northwest Iowa in Cherokee County. Uh, my dad and I operate together. Uh, we run over about uh, 2,000 acres of row crops, uh, and then we also operate this feedlot together. Um, <clears throat> right now, uh, at the feedlot, we're just shy of 1,000 head, um, but we utilize a few other yards, uh, some back background yards, and then a few yards at my place. Um, so we feed <clears throat> right now about uh, 1,750 to 1,800 head of cattle. Um, so annually, we will produce about a million pounds of fresh beef from this place. Um, and we're considered a small operation. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we get to uh, explore what we do here, kind of taking over from uh, where Betsy leaves off. Um, and the reason why we uh, feed more cattle in Iowa on the finish side uh, is because we ha we are able to grow row crops. Um, and we grow a lot of corn here, I'm sure you guys know that. Uh, so <clears throat> it's easier to move the livestock to where the feed is and then ship the meat back to a state like New York. Um, and then we also get to uh, utilize some of the other byproducts that we have in the area. Uh, we have a lot of ethanol plants that we get feed from, um, but then we'll also touch on a few things that we get to utilize uh, the, the manure for fertilizer for the crops. So it's, it's really a, a pretty green cycle. Uh, and if you, uh, you think about what these animals do, they're absolute excellent upcyclers. Fantastic. And uh, so I'm going to ask you some questions, kind of help you guide you along and everything as we move forward. So feedlots in Iowa are, are relatively prevalent because like you said, you grow a lot of corn. And we have a few here in New York State, but it's just not as uh, big or there's not a lot of them. And ours are, have, uh, have uh, roofs over them just because of the amount of snow that we have. But my one question is, is where do you get all of the 
cows that you put in your feedlot? Where do you, where do you source them from? Uh, excellent question. So um, <clears throat> we do source our cattle from quite a few different areas. Uh, it really depends on what time of year it is. Um, we will in the uh, uh, in the fall October time frame we get a lot of cattle from Montana, uh, the Dakotas out west, uh, where those ranches uh, calve in the spring and are ready to wean those calves before winter hits. So those cows uh, don't have a calf on the side during winter. Uh, during the summer months, we'll source a lot of cattle out of uh, southern Iowa, Missouri. Uh, we've had some out of Kentucky, Tennessee, Virginia, uh, and out east. Uh, so it's really uh, any direction you want to point, we've, we've sourced cattle from. So is there, are we going to take a little walk towards the feedlot? Because I got somebody saying, hey, they'd, they'd like to see what it looks like. And, uh, sure. and talk about um, the animal weight and growth. So when they come as we were walking through and, and you're getting closer, so Betsy says when her calf is born, they like them about 70 to 80 pounds or so. And then they go yep. off to the seat stop and to, they get off their moms and they go to the backgrounder for about that six to 12 months. When they get to you, uh, roughly how, what is their age and how much do they weigh? Uh, so good question. Um, we do <clears throat> on we do a variety of different things here. Um, so uh, uh, we will get calves in, like uh, balling calves, freshly weaned calves, uh, and those we usually feed steers here. Uh, so <clears throat> if they're uh, a young calf, then we're going to be weighing around 600 pounds, 650 pounds. Um, and like, th for example, these cattle here would have gone to a background yard. Uh, so these cattle are just arrived here recently and they're going to weigh closer to a thousand pounds. Yeah. So <clears throat> it, it does, a, we do a, several different things throughout the course of the course of the year, just kind of depends on time frame and, um, what we have going on and how it fits in everybody's cycle, so. Very good, and then how much time do they actually spend on, on your farm at the feedlot once they get there? Um, so, like I said, if we bring them in as calves, they, they will come in uh, lighter, so they will stay longer. Um, so if they show up in October, we'll actually be, October 1st, we'll actually be selling those cattle uh, here in the next week or so. Uh, so that uh, would give us seven, eight months. Uh, these cattle that we background or that were backgrounded uh, will probably be here between 150 to 170 days, roughly. Um, just depends on their rate of gain and the conditions that uh, the summer gives us. So, so are you near some feed? Because uh, that's one of the other things too, is that, and, and the fact that you have a nice backdrop of all those round bales as to what you feed when they are there at the, um, at the feed lot. What, what do we feed them when they're at the feed lot? Yep. Is that? Yep, what do, we, what do you feed yeah. them? You got the round bales behind you, but uh, do you have a, uh, yeah. do you feed them? We can run down and show you what we feed, you, feed them. Um, so, uh, it's a, a ration of, uh, grass, uh, corn stalks, um, we feed earlage, um, and then we also use a, a byproduct called modified distiller's grain, which is something that's, uh, left over from producing ethanol. Um, <clears throat> and then we also have some mineral supplements that we balance the ration with. So we utilize uh, a nutritionist to give us those rations. Um, we have a series of six to seven different rations that we'll feed uh, through the course while they're here from a real high roughage ration when the calves arrive uh, to a higher energy, higher corn concentration ration towards the end of their life cycle. Um, we're just getting down here to the uh, feed bunker 
we can show you some examples of the feed we've got. Um, so what's your approach in the bunker? Would that be considered? Oh, I like to, would be considered what? I said what you uh, have in the bunker right there, would that be considered earlage? And, and what is earlage? Yeah, so uh, right here would be a mixture of grass, hay, and alfalfa, which is a really good calf starter. Um, so then the earlage here um, is we harvest this once a year in fall. So the way I describe it is if you think of uh, like an ear of sweet corn that you have at dinner, we take that entire cob, husk, corn, everything, and you grind it into one mix like this, and then we we pile it and we pack it, throw it in siles, and it makes a really high quality feed. It smells good, it smells like bubble gum almost. Um, so we use that as part of a ration. And then we come over here, and this would be shell corn. So going back to the example of the sweet corn, um, this would just be obviously the corn off the cob. Um, and this is a large portion of what we feed um, throughout the years. So, and then over here <clears throat> would be the modified distiller's grain that I talked about that comes out of the ethanol plants. Um, and this, uh, we just got a load in here today. So, um, it's one, it's a product that <clears throat> without livestock would end up in a landfill or as the compost and then possibly spread back on a field. But it's something that we get to utilize actually is the benefit to you, um, to cattle feeders uh, because it provides so much protein. And then over here, uh, like those round bales that you look at, this is corn stalks. Uh, and we grind these. And cattle need uh, an amount of roughage in their diet <clears throat> to keep their stomachs uh, working. Um, because the, the rumen is actually a, a fermenting device, uh, which in the winter time helps keep them warm. Uh, so stomach health and nutrition are vital to keeping cattle healthy, um, which this is why uh, if you got an example of my, this is why we run all of our rations through uh, software. So this is something that you might not know, but uh, it's really kind of a tech heavy, it's becoming more tech heavy uh, because we have to keep track of how we feed and what we feed and to keep that consistent um, is, a large, is, a, is, is a very important piece of keeping them healthy while they're here at the feedlot. And I know, I think Dan has some slides of that too. Yeah, and that's uh, really interesting. and. and uh, you know, looking at all those things that you're feeding that animal, and you're taking an entire corn stalk. I mean, as humans, we just eat the, the, the corn off, off of the cobs that, you know, either comes in a can or we, by this time of year, we're starting to get corn on the cob and celebrate summer. But you're taking that whole corn stalk and then you're taking distillers leftovers and stuff. And so we always often say that, you know, cattle are real upcyclers, you know, in that, in that sense is that we can take that inedible pro uh, product the, the cattle can, whether it's grass and, and the corn stalks, because let's face it, humans aren't eating the car, corn stalk or the distiller grain, and we're turning it into a, a nutritious protein called beef and it's steak or burgers. And, you know, and, and then you kind of segue into the fact that you are really careful about what you feed and giving that animal a balanced diet, because it, those are some of those priorities of animal health. And, and, uh, Talk a little bit more about the animal health and how you keep uh, in line with that animal to make sure that they are healthy and, and what you do, um, uh, what you do to make sure that animal is healthy every day. <clears throat> yes, sure. So a couple things we do, um, uh, we, when we receive them from uh, a place like Betsy's uh, where we get the calves, we will, uh, upon delivery, we actually work with uh, our local vet office um, and we come up with a protocol on how to, what we 
you want for vaccines or um, <clears throat> and then uh, we will uh, run the cattle through and and rebooster the shots that Betsy gave uh, if the timing is right uh, but then we also <clears throat> uh, on a daily basis we we walk the pins, we check the cattle over, we look and see if they need individual attention. Uh, just like anything, humans, whoever, kids, uh, you you get hurt, stuff happens, you're playing around, you know, uh, you get a scratch or a scar or something needs stitched up or hurt your foot, um, <clears throat> you know, so you do have to walk through and make sure uh, everybody's okay. But uh, yeah, I, I think the two most important things that we do is work with our nutritionist and our local vet's office to come up with uh, plans on how to feed and how to treat, so. That's fantastic. And you know, one of the things that I noticed when you first uh, approached your feedlot and, and the cattle and stuff is that they have a lot of space. A lot of times, you know, pictures are shown to kind of show that they're all kind of crowded together and it's usually at the feed bunker. And of course, that's where uh, they all eat. But the amount of space that um, your cattle have to, to walk around and I know that it oftentimes is, is beveled in a sense where there's high areas where they always have an opportunity to be in a dry spot even if it rains or snows. Um, it is, uh, can you explain that a little bit and, 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 and how oftentimes that we see cattle hanging out together real close? You know, so <clears throat> cattle are a herd animal. Um, so if, if you've ever worked with cattle or, or uh, with that BQA, uh, Beef Quality Assurance Program, uh, the training that's involved there, it shows, uh, it talks about how to work with animals, um, what they, how they like to be handled. Um, and so if you're familiar with working with cattle, uh, if you get one by himself and you're trying to work with him, uh, they become more fight or flight, I guess. It's, uh, uh, <clears throat> they, they like to be around other cattle. Um, it's, it's a comforting factor. Uh, so it, it, there's a difference in inside uh, under a roof like this and outside uh, for several different reasons. Um, Outside cattle need more space uh, to get more airflow uh, because there's more sunshine on them, uh, especially in the summer months. Um, and then uh, like this building, uh, the cleanliness uh, is a huge factor too on how close we can put them. Um, so <clears throat> it's, a, it's a more natural thing for cattle to be, that, that like to be in close with the whole group and not be separated off singly or whatever. Fantastic. So now, Nate, thank you so much for giving us overview. But so now we're gonna bring Betsy back and we're gonna talk to both of you and we're gonna talk about it, the environment in general, how you each take care of the environment on your respective farms and then and dive back into that BQA aspect of it. But real quick, I want Dan to go back to that life cycle. So in essence, we went to the cow calf at Betsy's and then she weaned her cattle and maybe send it off to a stocker backgrounder where they'll last there for six to 12 months and eat a lot of grass. And then they'll go to a place like Nate's, which is that feedlot. And, and, and uh, Nate will feed them off for about, he said, 150 to 170 days. And when they're done at that feed yard, what they'll do is they'll be loaded up and they'll go to that packing plant. And those packing plants will then process that beef, that cattle, and send it to the supermarkets and the food service. And uh, that's something that we've all learned in the, the last few months with this, the whole COVID aspect of it is getting it from the farm to your center of the plate. There's a lot of steps in between, but definitely there is beef out there and we're putting it back on that plate left and right and uh, definitely on your grills for the summer. So let's go back and see Betsy again. The cattle are all around here and loving her to death. And Betsy, I want to talk to you a little bit and how you kind of care for the environment on and around your farm and, and how you care um, not just for your land, but as well as your neighbors as well. Yeah, so 
in the summer months, we are out on pasture. So like I said, from May until November, we're, we're able to put these ladies out on pasture. And we use several things in order to keep the pasture healthy, which keeps the soil healthy and provides good nutritious cows to graze. So we employ uh, rotational, <laughs> rotational grazing. They just got moved into this paddock and three to four days, it'll be time to move on. So the grass has time to and regenerate and make the soil nice and healthy so that when we come back through in about 24 days that the grass is regenerated and we still have very, very healthy grass. Um, part of this rotational grazing system is a part of a book that I call the, our comprehensive nutrient management plan. And I do like this because it literally is three inches thick. For the 85 cows we have on this farm, 85 cows in the grand scheme of things isn't a lot, but those 85 cows create a lot of manure. And while we're out on pasture, the manure goes out of the pasture, but the other six months of the year, we do have to feed in confinement. So we keep them in a barn um, and we, we spend a lot of time, I'm glad it's uh, somewhat sunny out today so you can't see my sunglasses tan line. We've been hard at work creating feed and storing feed to, to feed our cows um, over the summer or over the winter months. So when we feed them over the winter months, our cows eat a mixture of baleage um, and corn silage. And so, um, and the younger, the younger calves are the calves that we've weaned to get uh, grain as well. So that manure is collected and it is saved in order to put back out onto the fields that we have a lot of nutrients for the growing crop and so we want to make sure we save that and store that and put it on the fields when it's appropriate um, we save it in a way that it doesn't pollute clean water and so we want clean water to stay clean and we want manure to go on the fields when it is appropriate to do so so comprehensive nutrient management plan rotational grazing and being really really conscious about what we do with manure and when we do it so well, that's awesome. So now we're going to jump to Nate. And Nate, can you, you know, let's face it, manure is part, uh, a big part of your, your cattle, but what do you do to take care? Woo! Nate sideways. <laughs> Kyle, you're going to have to, to flip them over because Nate's leaning to the left real bad. <laughs> um, Nate, you, can you explain uh, what you do? There we go. What you do <laughs> in the environment and... Um, and not only for your farm, um, but for your neighbors as well. Sure, you bet. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, utilizing this building, uh, we're actually 100% containment. Um, so, there's uh, nothing that can leave this building. Um, and <clears throat> the, the great thing about uh, uh, manure, uh, so the cycle starts with the feed. The feed grows the beef eventually, and then the, the cattle create the fertilizer that goes back to produce the crop to feed the next group of cattle uh, next year. So um, <clears throat> these, uh, that cycle is actually really efficient, uh, more so than it gets credit for. Um, so to start with, um, and this stuff, the farthest this will go from here is three miles down the road. Uh, Oops, it looks like we lost Dan real quick. So we're gonna jump back to Betsy super fast. And Betsy, I want you to talk about beef quality assurance. I know Nate uh, mentioned it earlier when we were going through some things, but um, what, what, is, uh, what is beef? BQA to you, and, and when we talk about BQA with our consumers and producers and stuff, it's, it's that quality aspect, but it's something that I kind of equate to that if it, it's like a HACCP program for a small restaurant, but it's the same HACCP program that a big restaurant is gonna have as well. So what does BQA mean to you? Yeah, so BQA to me, um, it starts with a relationship that I have with my veterinarian. Um, and, and Dan referenced the relationship he has with his local vet as well. And it's super important. Um, even if I don't need my vet to come out, I can still text her and say, hey, I got this going on. What do you think about that? And it might be something simple 
level, um, but it might be something that she does need to come out. Um, but we've worked together to create a vaccination protocol so that our cows stay healthy um, and we stay disease free. Um, but in the rare occasion that perhaps one animal does get sick or it does need treatment, um, we have the protocols in place to uh, treat the animal effectively with as little treatment as possible. Um, and that treatment is a prescription that the veterinarian gives to me. Um, and it is for that animal, it is for that animal's weight, and it is for that animal's particular disease or uh, problem that they might be facing. Um, for a small herd like ours, uh, last year, in the last year, I have had to treat an animal, one, three animals. <laughs> that is it. Three animals have been treated with antibiotics. And I keep detailed records on what was given, when it was given, and um, if in, we had to send that animal for slaughter, uh, the withhold time where her uh, carcass would be free of any um, antibiotic traces. Um, like I said, three animals in the last year. It is, antibiotics are a tool that I feel are really important that we have to use because nobody likes to, everybody likes to see healthy animals, but on occasion, we do have sick animals, and it is important to treat them when we need to treat them, but judiciously. <laughs> well, Stephanie, thanks a lot uh, for that, and, and we're going to get back to Nate for a second here, and uh, that now that he's reconnected, and uh, Dan will bring him back here. Um, so, Nate, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Sorry about that. We're having a little little technical difficulties here so hey welcome to technology and and uh, we, we put it on the cows how's that so you were exactly. talking about manure and then we briefly um to segue in we talked about bqa with betsy and what that means to her but if you want to feel, feel, finish your thought process as to the manure management or uh, uh and uh, the environment that you take care of uh we'll we'll hit with you for a second sure yep so uh to finish the 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 fertilizer part of the equation uh it it we get to utilize that fertilizer um and then we we have uh that that fertilizer value that we get from the building and from our outside yards covers almost 80 percent of the fertilizer needs to uh for the feed for the next year's group of cattle uh so we're not bringing in commercial fertilizer uh which <clears throat> manure actually is uh, less likely to leach into the waterways uh, than commercial fertilizer is from an Iowa State study that I've read. Um, and then also uh, commercial fertilizer is uh, uh, made from petroleum, from natural gas or mined from the ground and then hauled from other countries via ship up the river, then drove by truck to here. So, uh, it's it's uh it's really kind of a green cycle when you think of it on what you would do otherwise uh but then you also factor in that we're producing uh uh you know somewhere around a million pounds of beef uh which feeds about 18,000 people if my math's right for an entire year um <clears throat> and then to touch on the BQA side uh it, and it kind of goes back to what Betsy talked about originally uh, is reducing the level of stress uh, when you do have to do something with an animal uh, is pretty much uh, what we do here. Um, you know, we try to control what we can control uh, with uh, via the building, uh, the feed, the outside yards, how we handle the cattle, how we, what we treat and how we treat. Um, so, <clears throat> That's great. And, and uh, so what I want to kind of want to open it up to people that are viewing, because we have a lot of viewers, is do you have any questions? We are more than happy if you want to make a question just to Betsy or to Nate or a combination of both. We definitely invite it because now is the time to ask those burning questions that you always have um, or, or you may have or hopefully we maybe answered a lot of them. But um, it uh, it definitely is is worth that conversation and uh you know and feel free to ask ask our producers uh, about their livelihood and and what they do uh and in case we didn't touch on something um so we'll put that out there a little bit and i'm trying to encourage folks to to be brave and ask so you can see here, let's see, no questions at the moment. 
All right, and back at, we pop back to New York and we're taking a look at, oh, look at the mama. She's cleaning off the babies. It's bath time. They probably mm -hmm. late breakfast and uh, they're getting ready to clean up for lunch, aren't they, Betsy? It, yeah, it's, it's so nice that today is nice and cloudy and cool and windy. Um, cows really don't <laughs> enjoy heat all that much. I think I'm built like a cow in that respect. I'm built more for winter. Um, yeah. They really enjoy these cool, cloudy days, and I'm so thankful for that. Uh, we have that today because they've been very uh, good <laughs> subjects for us to, to watch. So um, the thing, though, I do want to talk about a little bit, if we've got time, um, the care that we do in the wintertime for them. Um, I've been carrying around this calf coat, which is kind of silly. Um, so we do calve in the wintertime, like I said, and... While the cows are built for winter, it's like, you know, Dan's, or not Dan, uh, Nate's talked about how they have, uh, it's like a big fermentation vat, and that rumen creates a lot of heat. And so they're built for the winter. Baby calves, though, um, don't have that rumen yet. They are like a monogastric, so they live on milk, right, when they're first born. And so cold temperatures, especially when we calve in February and March, um, they're really too cold for a baby calf sometimes. And so we have this calf jacket that occasionally we'll have to put on a calf if, if it's born um, and it's really windy that day or they have uh, trouble getting dry. Mama has licked them off well enough before the cold sets in. And so we'll go out and put calf jackets on these little baby calves. Um, for the first couple days uh, to make sure that they are creating enough heat and staying warm. Um, the trick is getting the calf jackets off before they have their wheels underneath them and you can't catch them. <laughs> so, um, real quick, I'm going to jump back to Nate and I'm going to ask Nate, what is your favorite part of being a beef producer? Favorite part about being a beef producer? Uh, when I get to grill the steak at the end of the day and, and eat something that <clears throat> that you got to see go through the full cycle, uh, it's that's what I enjoy. Um, I also enjoy you have to enjoy being around livestock. Um, you have to enjoy uh, working with them every day, uh, or this job's not for you, I guess. Um, so I, I really do enjoy being around the animals. So that's that's the highlight of my. Yep. Thank you so much, Nate. I'm going to bounce back to Betsy in a second and ask her the same question, but I wanted to take the moment now because we're going to be wrapping this up. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I know it's a little um, earlier out in Iowa, and we really appreciate you sharing your story and your farm to us here in New York because we don't oftentimes don't get to see the scope of something that you run and manage and, and know that Potentially, your beef comes back here and feeds all uh, a lot of our population. So thank you for your time and energy today, Nate. And thank you again, Iowa, for this partnership because it's it, we, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. Hey, thank you for the opportunity to do this. I'd uh, love to shed some light on stuff that uh, uh, doesn't normally get out there. So uh, I appreciate you putting this together for us. So thank you. Not a problem. So Betsy, one last question to you. What's your favorite thing about being a beef producer? Well, I think you can tell my cows hate me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I enjoy every single second I get to spend with these ladies. Um, I really feel like, especially being a small producer, and uh, you know, we have deer around and occasionally cows get out. When I call, they come. And that is like the feeling of power, I tell you what. <laughs> so yeah, no, my favorite thing about being a producer is uh, the, the relationship I have with these ladies. They, um, you know, if you, you put it into a scale of, in a day, they might see me for about a half an hour a day, um, but the trust that they have in me is pretty incredible. And that just, you know, and other producers have the same relationship that I have, they have with their cows that I have with mine. And, you know, literally we don't spend a lot of time with them, but yet the trust that they have in us really shows the care that we have for them. And, the um, just the environment we try to create for them that is stress-free and gives them a very natural nourishing place to grow. So yeah, it's the relationship I have with these ladies. <laughs> That's really cool. And thank you so much for your time today, Betsy, and your sharing of your farm. I know that we've um, utilized your expertise in, in the past and, and visited your farm and maybe we'll get you to cook next time. And, you know, um, 
it, it's a, always a pleasure to, to make those connections and just to hear the passion that you have and Nate has. And thank you for taking the time for sharing it and, and practicing with us. And, uh, you know, and thank the girls for being so, you know, willing to be photogenic. And, you know, so many times just, girls just don't want to be in front of a camera. And they are, they are definitely Hollywood happy. So we're, we're they okay. are beautiful bovines. <laughs> so. So everyone, I just like to take the time to thank everyone for joining us. Um, there was a lot of awesome watchers. Um, obviously we answered everybody's questions because there wasn't a lot of questions. And, uh, but if you have any afterwards, please feel free to pop it into the Facebook page and we will be more than happy to answer them either on Betsy's behalf or we'll, we'll ask Betsy to join in or Nate or, um, themselves. Again, thank you to Iowa Beef Council for making this opportunity happen. It's that partnership that creates these virtual opportunities. Oftentimes we, we push it solely out to the schools, but since schools are kind of virtually in session, we went the virtual route, went Facebook Live as well to show everybody that, that they can have an educational opportunity about um, the farming uh, community, both here in New York and in Iowa, and to show that whole scope. So. Um, again, thank you to Kylie, and thank you to Dan, and thank you to Nate, Catherine, our videographers, and uh, you guys all have a great day, and thanks for your help.